things that you will need before you can start tinning your skin. Category, I have something about it. How much of episode one was like the our individual recordings? Was it all just this Discord bot? No. Um I think maybe like 95% of it was the Discord bot. Um and then the last like five percent it somehow stopped recording. What a bit. Like, yeah. Um, and that's that's something that we'll have to figure out probably the next episode is um making sure we're all recording like on our computers as well so just in case it does go out like that again okay we'll be able to, uh, capture that here's my thing though is like i tried to record a track in garage band and like i tested it and everything but then it didn't i mean i'm just stupid like i just don't i just didn't know how to work <laughs> it it might have just it probably was even just um on the export too it might have just been the settings who knows but yeah we'll that is through. so generous of you i really think it was just like the fact that i pressed record and like didn't think about the fact that like oh i have to like have something to record into i can't just speak to my computer <laughs> i mean you sound good now though what do you what are you recording yeah well now? i mean i'm just i'm on my i'm on my earbuds but that's the thing is like i just need to get like a better like a situation because like i said like i can check something out from the new york public library and like they have like podcast mics and oh word everything so because I I was listening to the episode before this and I was like Kwame sounds great I sound like garbage, <laughs> not garbage but you sound good so I just need to get a little bit better set up. I mean, I'll send you Kwame's running into a mic. Yeah, right. I'm that's using I mean. a Shure SM48S. So I mean, I'll send you I'll send you everything I'm using and I'll I will even send you like um links to like an even cheaper kit because what I'm using right now is just like shit that I've picked up over the years. Okay. So I mean, I'll cool. I'll send you a list of like stuff under a hundred dollars, stuff under fifty bucks, stuff under two hundred. So you have okay. like a whole whole range Inspired. of shit. Yeah. I mean, I'm fully like holding my right earbud string in between my thumb and my pointer finger, and holding the little mic thing to my mouth like I am <laughs> on oh, Vine shit. or something. <laughs> we'll keep it to like we'll keep it to like an hour and a half, so your arm doesn't just like hey. fall asleep. No, no, oh I actively, God. I actively decided to lay down in bed, so I'm just kind of like resting my arm on my chest and holding it up. So we're good. We're in the clear. <laughs> you got to set up. <laughs> John, what are you recording on? Um, the last time I recorded on an on a Zoom H6, but when I listened to your recording, it sounded like all of the s- stuff from me was just from Discord. So I'm not recording separately this one. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you sound but fine I, too. I easily, I easily can. I could record on uh, uh, on an Alexa if you wanted and send you the footage. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm John. I work at a gear house and <laughs> I have gear. Are the C500 Mark IIs out yet? The C500? Yeah, Mark IIs. Yeah, they're great cameras. Yeah, I just now saw those. They're like $15,000. Yeah, they're they've been out for a while, Have they? but they're they're, they're awesome. awesome. Yeah, they looked really really nice. Even the C three hundred Mark threes are really nice. I didn't know about that shit. Mark threes. Yeah, I'm, they're... I'm really far behind. I'm still trying to get like a C one hundred. I was like, yo, that's honestly no, don't pretty don't do cool. that. I mean, I'm fine with 1080p. Like, it's fine. It's fine. I don't know, man. If you want to talk about what camera you should buy, we should let talk later. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, right. I'm I'm hip. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. You see, like all the all the shit right now. I have like this really. I've got a decent little handheld Ronin. Um, I forgot what I think it's like a Canon MS twenty Mark II. It's it's decent. Like it shoots it shoots fine, especially for the shit that I want to use it for. Well, I'm you guys are fucking elitist, so I'm just gonna record my feature on my flip camcorder that has a USB that I can plug into my Bro, if you can find a flip camera. <laughs> Dude, on oh God. Yeah. I, I have I have a friend that her and her boyfriend both have one. <laughs> that's that's incredible. I had one, but I could not get it to work. I could not get it to record anything. What if John Cassavetes rec- filmed one of his movies on a flip? 
I could. He, I could he probably would have. Yeah. Faces was definitely filmed on a flip camera. Oh, equivalent. Yeah, I'll say it. Equivalent. I so I've been talking to myself uh, because I'm alone about the this episode, and yeah. I'm fully anticipating it to begin as a John Cassavetes episode and end as a Gina Rowlands episode. Especially okay, that, that feels like right directed at me. That feels directed no, at me. No, no, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on it. I'm just I'm just especially considering the three movies that we chose with I would consider an honorable mention with Chinese Bookie. That's uh, we're just feeling of we're just I mean it's Gina's like three best films ever. And maybe John's three best films ever too. And I just I'm fully prepared for us to just become a shrine to Gina Rowlands for this episode. It's, it's kind of wild you say that too. Yeah, go ahead. Go on, Scott. <laughs> it's just crazy to think about the fact that like I mean, you can't separate their like real life utter love and infatuation with one another from any of the movies and any of their dynamics within the movies, you know? Yeah, like for sure. It, that's why I think Love Streams is so fascinating because they're playing oh, brother God, and sister. Yes. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Yeah. There Love is Streams just, is so fucked up. Yeah, exactly. I, I it's like... It. It's so fucked up. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, sure. I, I agree. I mean... I mean, I, I don't, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, I meant I agree that like it'll just end up turning into like a general and so like oh for sure, for sure, for sure. like for sure. especially as the Oscars are approaching and she was never and she never won. I think she was only nominated she for her. she yeah. got nominated for Woman Under the Influence. That's it. She she yeah. never won. It was the same year as um, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Fucking bullshit of a movie. Chris Christopherson can suck my baby penis. I mean, I agree. I think that um, what's his name Peter Fox. I think his performance was incredible, especially compared to like the uh, the male counterpart to like the female character. Um, and like not and not to be like hashtag like, wi- like women. Me. Not I mean, to that's be like, what the entire year was. <sighs> but yeah. not to be hashtag women, but like. It's just really when you think about all of these, three, all three of these performances, if we're talking about Jenna Rollins, are, I mean, you put them up against like any best actor from any year and you could be like, oh, it's, it's stomping. This it. is better. Yeah, I was actually easy. at, I was getting, I was getting a beer with a friend before this and I was telling him about how we were about to record this. So kind of half practicing some of the things I was going to say as well. But I was telling him and I was like, I mean, seriously, it's like if, if, if you asked a hundred people on the street, like who's the best actor of all time, they'd probably say like Marlon Brando, right. Or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I just feel like his best performance does not even like I'm close. It doesn't even like, it doesn't have access to the, to the gate, to the neighborhood, to the home, to the specific room (laughs) and chair that Jenna Rollins is sitting in. I mean, I think that, I think that's a testament to um, like her collaborative, like the collaborations that they that they had together, um, her and Cassavetes. Because yeah, um, I I watched that. Um, it's like a bonus feature in that Criterion, um, for Love Streams. Yeah, and it's um, really good. It's really fucking good. Yeah, um, they talk about uh like her performances in other movies as well. Which I mean, that's the thing is like th- so much of this feels like a Jenna Rollins uh a Gen- Jenna Rollins uh episode, um. Instead of a like, instead of purely just the Cassavetes episode, um, because the performances in the other movies don't necessarily feel like this one. Like it's it's more a testament to her ability as an actor and like the power that she brings to the screen. Um, the fact that she's like what she's able, like yeah, the accessibility um, that she brings into these characters, like they feel way more human. While um, Brando, especially with all the method, feels so much. Like through all of it, you can almost see through it a little bit. You know yeah, I mean? well, and like I, you know, John, you said like how this is a Cassavetes episode that's going to turn into Jenna Rollins. Like, I mean, in some way, like that is organically how films 
like become part of the culture, right? Like they're so like the actors are the last people to even sometimes be like connected to a thing. Mm -hmm. But like he wrote all of these roles for her. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's like she was integrally like connected to every single one of these projects. And I, but I also think like the reason she's so good is because of his style and because of his method and because of the way that he made his films, which is what makes him like such a darling of like the American indie like cinema. You know, like yeah. they were f shooting yeah, love streams in into. their house. You Bro, know what I mean? Like, like, so are we starting with love streams? Because we're about to go. Uh, I mean, we're already, already going, going off. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm crying. I'm crying. <laughs> right, well, I'm, I'm in tears. I'm reduced. To, I'm a re I'm reduced to tears. Laying on your side and making yourself cry does not count as crying, Scott. We all know that absolutely know. counts as crying. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying. No, I just mean I. I think that like he he was so his aesthetically. You can just feel that like the thing that is the object that's you're watching is not like. A lot of the other things that you're seeing and i think for me one of the reasons that it feels that way is because these projects are born out of like this mutual love that and understanding that they have for one another that like it's just one of those things like you can't get that from like any other connection and then the way the way that all of the films and i mean specifically like woman under the influence i'll say really kind of feels like you're watching something that almost feels like documentarian like it, it it almost feels like you're watching something you shouldn't be watching yeah you know yeah. um uh so that, i mean that's like more of a like general kind of statement about the whole thing but i mean with love streams like love streams is is like a tough nut to crack for me because like it i think like Formally, it's, his it's most so abstract film. What'd you say? It's his most abstract film, in my opinion. Yeah, and and it feels abstract in a way that like, um, the the other two feel um very like raw and very um, and and it feels very like technical and considered in a way that the that the other two we'll talk about don't. Yeah, it definitely it definitely feels a little bit raw. I, and I think that, which is weird because there were so many drafts of that movie made, right? And so much of his style, a lot of people like to assume that so much of it is improvised, and it and it kind of feels improvised, like due to that raw nature of it. But it is it's all of it is very intentional, and that he had a lot of trouble, um, sort of finding, like figuring out how to be like this character. Um, which is her brother while also being their husband while living in their house. Well, those, are those their kids or no? Some like of them are like them? two of two of them are. Yeah, that's that's such a freaky same, situation. Same thing in, in Woman Under the Influence. Two of the kids are theirs. That's super freaky. And and uh, there's one specific shot in, in Woman where. I think it's when Peter Falk slaps her the first time or something. Yeah. And. Uh, it's some act of violence and there's like an immediate cutaway to a little boy. And that's their kid. And that, that was Nick Cassavetes, the future director of the fucking notebook. Yo. <laughs> sounds like you have, it sounds, that sounds like you had a gripe with it. It just, it just makes me sad. <laughs> I like, mean, what? not to like defend the notebook, um, but like, it, it is, is a very emotional movie, no, and no, I think yeah. the av the average American audience hasn't seen a more emotional movie besides that one. No, no, it's it's good. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. I mean, you know, I'm just happy that the son was able to make the money that the parents were never able to make. Yeah, yeah. You know? Why'd you why'd you choose Love Streams? Like, is that is that your favorite Casavetes or no? Uh, I don't think so. No, I think opening night is probably my favorite. And mm -hmm. but love streams was one of my first. Okay. And I think I'm with Scott. It's it's a tough nut to crack, but uh, there there's like there's a list of movies that I have that. I haven't figured out yet, quote unquote, mm, but I, 
but I love them and I watch them often and think about them often because I don't I don't really know you know there's something there's something that a filmmaker is reaching for in a mm. film and sometimes it gets destroyed on set or left on the floor in the editing room but sometimes it gets nailed and then sometimes there are these films that are like like creating a perimeter around what they're reaching for and they never quite get it but you get the sense that there's something else and it just makes me want to watch them again uh what else is on that list white material by claire denis yeah well say her uh, name again say her name again <laughs> the last movie <laughs> say by... her name again why did you say her name again claire denis, mommy <laughs> thank queen you, thank you <laughs> The last movie by Dennis Hopper. Uh, oh. uh, images by Robert Altman. Uh, Winter Sleep by a guy whose name I can't pronounce. Ceylon, I think is how you say his last name. There's just, even um, even if we end up doing the Vim Vendors episode, Wrong Move, the one I recommended, it's like a deep cut. I I I don't know what that movie is about, but I uh, it's like so fucking good. So I mean, where but, are you then right now with with Love Streams? Then, like, what do you feel with it? Well, I mean, I I rewatched it again for for us for this episode, and oh, the <laughs> the uh, I mean, I rewatched all three, but with Love Streams, it was. Um, I was thinking more about the the setting and you know you think a lot about like what it must have been like to be them and be an actual couple and be recording in their actual house filled with actual memories and you have these two actors that are very good at kind of becoming other and like just dropping in and seemingly existing solely in the moment and that that's really easy to think about but like the i was just so aware of a director this time mm -hmm. because with cassavetti's movies for me the reason why i'm drawn to them is because it is performance first and foremost yeah. and like he doesn't give a fuck about aesthetics, but somehow his films are all really beautiful. Like a, like some of the close-ups in Woman Under the Influence are like some of the best close-ups I've ever seen. I mean, but you know, it, I, but you know that it's just Cassavetes was like, go stand in that corner because like that's the one corner that we're not going to be in, and just like zoom in. And they just got the shots. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't like, we got to fucking light it for this close up and like, blah, 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 blah. He just was, it, it, especially with woman, with everything that I've read about how that set went, it was, it, even in the way that it was filmed, very documentary like. You know, just well, like film what is I happening. I think that that gets to the, the point of why Love Streams in some way is so peculiar and fascinating but maybe in some ways also kind of like because all of these all of these films were like his attempt at like establishing himself as a director in some way too right like they like mm -hmm. specifically with woman like they funded that thing like he did rosemary's baby he so that he could Mary's fund Mary. yeah so yeah. they could pay to do that but like with yeah. love streams it almost feels like well with opening night and with woman under the influence oh, they're this Hold on like um, I have to, let me make sure it's still recording. I see the little bear with his mic. Still recording. Oh shit. Okay. Sorry, my bad. No, you're good. <laughs> um, I think with opening night and woman under the influence, like they are this like intense voyeuristic perspective of a woman who is descending into madness. And so, in some way, like the aesthetic of each film is defined by like where that that character is found in the moment. 
but like with love streams it feels really dedicated to like telling a story and 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 having some sense of like a plot in a way that the other two maybe don't you know like mm -hmm. and and i think in some way like that is maybe something that cassavetes like didn't in some way know like what to do with and so it for me, that's why it feels the most kind of like, like you said, abstract and therefore kind of a tough nut to crack because I think it maybe in some way was like a, a nut that he was trying to crack as well. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. I think he was, I think there was a lot, you're juggling a lot of things as a director, actor, producer on set. So, I mean, like for as raw as um, Jenna is sort of kind of allowed to be, Casavetti's, especially in that performance, there's a lot that he's dealing with. Um, I mean, and, and I usually don't do a lot of um, like background research into sort of the uh, like how the set went and everything. I usually just kind of like try to look at it. And then if, if I like it, I don't. If I if I do, then I just kind of like try to leave it in a vacuum a little bit. But obviously with the Criterion Collection, it, it's so much of it is just kind of like in there as far as bonus features and all of it looks so, you know, interesting just bit on how it's built. Um, and one of the things um, that they had in that little collection was an interview from like 1980 something where he's talking about it um, and how he had a little bit of trouble one grappling with how this was his wife, but also grappling um, with the fact that this is supposed to be the character that he's playing. is supposed to be this sort of debonair character that is, you know, womanizer um, and all this other shit. But he almost had like a lack of confidence in his physical appearance on how to play this character and how to sort of um, sort that in his mind um as well and i think the result was this was a character that was also trying to figure out sort of who he was and figure that out and and obviously that was that was written but it's it's different it's 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 sort of different when you're bringing so much of your real life also shooting in your own house also dealing with your kids also producing the film directing the film there's there was a lot of of sorting out it feels yeah. like just like just based just based on that yeah. alone like even without it, knowing it, that history yeah and it really is just like um unlike anything else to see how good of an actor he is <laughs> you know like yeah, knowing that he's also oh, making yeah. this movie that is like part of a canon of once again just like singular in the specifically american but then like world cinema do you know what i mean like i feel like every yeah. every director globally that i have outside of the states that i have like you know been into has in some way like looked at cassavetes and been like that is a person that inspired me oh, and for sure. he's behind the camera but then like he's in front of the camera also you know putting down like on celluloid like very very um rich complex performances that are like incredibly masculine but also specifically at that time period like very um I mean, insecure is... and like yeah. sensitive and um, i guess that's probably the better way to yeah yeah like i just it's it's i don't know it's wild to me but and scott think, you you yeah. think that love streams has more of a story or a plot than like opening night or opening night because i i, I feel so. like Bookie, i think that bookie is probably the most abstract personally but bookie is really weird for sure but the, i don't know there's something about love streams that feels like it was found in the editing room because uh i don't know if either of you guys have seen gloria which is the movie that he made before love streams no not yet which was like a it's yeah, like it's like with Jenna film. Rollins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah she's like, she's like, like a, yeah. She's like an assassin and yes. and uh she gets end up she ends up like having to take care of this kid throughout the movie and she's like an assassin with with like hits to make throughout the film. And that is like plot. Yeah. It, it doesn't even feel like a Cassavetes movie except for like one or two scenes. But I don't know, dude. Like, love streams. Like, when she shows up at the house with the two cabs, like, full of her luggage, 
that just comes out of nowhere. And like, does it though? I I feel like it does. Like I I mean, you get yeah, the you, sense, you almost like, like don't. Yeah, he's like a bachelor. Like you don't even get the sense that he's like ever met an actual woman that he hasn't fucked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah of course. He's, like, sure. he's got the house full of those chicks, and he like he gives the boy like beer in a wine glass and a crystal glass. He has like this whole bit about crystal glasses. Yeah. And like, yeah, it just, and, and then like the raining scene at the end with all the animals and like having to move them and like the dream sequence or whatever, Ooh. the, the like imagination sequence with Gina Rowland sitting at, next to the pool with Seymour Cassell. And they're like, maybe, maybe that's what it is, is that it's, it's not that it's like plot based, but that it's like, it's so, it's not a singular focus on like, an individual but there's so much like metaphor and image involved in it that it feels yeah. like attached yeah. to something beyond a human uh, and yeah. a yeah, character that... and a human body i think i think a lot of it i think a lot of it especially because i watched so many of these back to back um and that's something else i'm curious about did you guys watch any other movies besides cassavetti's over like the past couple weeks or no <laughs> yes Okay. Yeah. Same. Don't ask. No, don't like, ask me which ones I've watched. But I. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, I I'll, have. I'll let you guys know which ones I watched anyway, especially because I brought it up. I watched Birds and I watched Birdman, which is weird saying that out loud. Mm. Birds. Whoa. Bird. Yeah, but um. I have Birdman memorized. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was I watched it right after opening night, too, which nice. was interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's but, a fun double feature. You had a was, John Day. I did have a John Day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what was interesting about uh, watching so many of his movies back to back was that, especially with the ending, so much of so much of his movies end unresolved, right? So yeah. I was kind of I was kind of bracing for impact um, for his movies, especially getting to Love Streams because that was probably the last one I'd watched. Um, I was bracing for impact a lot of that movie, but so much of it did feel pretty straight, like it was especially when you look at his style, um, so much of it feels, you know, kind of French, kind of Italian, but, ve but also very much rooted in American as well, you know, because it's, it's looking at domestic life through a very, very, very voyeuristic lens, um, especially for the time period when you're looking at like, sort of like the nuclear family. Um, but like the rawness of it is what makes it feel almost alien to American style. Right. Um, but I think specifically with Love Streams, what, what made it connect for me um, on first watch was that, especially after watching his other movies, I was very much focused on, not really plot, nothing like that. I was really, really focused on relationships. Um, and throughout the beginning of the movie, both of these characters are, are very distressed, right? As, especially Jenna Rollins' character. It's, it's almost thrown in our face how how um, dysfunctional her life is currently. Um, obviously his life is too, but especially through the male lens, his life is, his life is great, right? Like you're with a bunch of young girls, all of them um, are kind of like treating you like fascisti uh, fascistically, almost like a dad, you know? Um, you almost don't even know why they're there besides the fact that like he's interviewing these women and he's a writer. Um, but like this, the fact that they're like they're they're searching for something he's he's searching for something probably almost um the same way his father was searching for something um especially because the fact that we don't really see him so he's probably even currently still searching and john's character is also searching currently at the bottom of the bottle or in the panties of one of these 18 year old girls um <laughs> who he's convincing that the thing that they really want is sex or excitement or something so you know stay here with me and you know, fuck me. Um, and clearly Jenna's character almost like, I like how they like the, uh, the editing of the scenes where she's in, um, almost like stealthily showing all the different places that she's going. She's not just like flying to France. She's in France. She's in Spain. By the time that we catch up with her again, she's in like England or something or Australia maybe. And she's saying like, I, I hate Europe. And he's like, yeah, I agree with you, ma'am. Um, so like, they're like both searching for each other, but like they hone in somehow on family. And like there is such a root like to family here um in this film. And that's like really what I focused in on. So like I'm still trying to crack this movie too, but there was there was something so raw and pure about like familial love and how these two people were 
almost like put back on the right track by by like this family dynamic that they were that they had with each other like mm. after being with her brother she was able to like not necessarily like she still had good you know, because his movies always end unresolved she didn't necessarily like understand the situation but she had like a path she had like a goal like in mind you know but that was that felt more feasible you know and then he was now stuck with a bunch of fucking animals in the house that are wet and shit but like now he but now he's like not treating a woman like a piece of meat like they like they were both like slightly getting better which is like the way that like Moshe and Cassavetti's films end or like the super unresolved like ah, I don't like do I even like like do I even feel good about where these characters are not necessarily but like it's life you know like they're at least like they're like inching towards the right spot like it's it's like the uh the, it's like you're uh, watching somebody who like at the beginning of the film is in the center of a crisis yeah and then the narrative of the, of the film is like watching them through time approaching the end of the film when they get to the almost exact same crisis and you're wondering whether or not they're going to have changed or be like the exact same yeah kind it's of. like the first step of like the stages of grief for like you're at depression and maybe you see the light at the end of the tunnel but like maybe you're gonna like turn around because it's like i mean the tunnel's comfortable like i was in there for so long you know it's like they're kind of like at that line to like maybe go to the next step of i don't know what the next stage of grief is but you know they could potentially just kind of stay in the tunnel too they may not make it to that to the end of it yeah i think it's denial yeah, but that's what I think that is so bleak about Which Love Streams is that like it really true. does feel like these two characters are like they get just nowhere. yeah, they're just like trapped. Like the the animals thing would it almost like has this um it's, so it, it's like this yeah, it's like this burst of energy and it's comedic but it's like so depressing <laughs> like yeah, at the yeah same a lot of that time. is funny and depressing. Like it's 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 yeah. almost like it's, it's a very very early well at least to me feels like an early example of like like real dark comedy of what we've just seen ad nauseum now like everybody's doing a dark comedy but like that movie felt like it was truly truly dark because especially the ending feels so unresolved but there was these moments of like almost hope in it too um that kind of brightened it up mo moments that kind of broke that that shit up yeah See, and I, I just keep thinking about like because Cassavetti's whole shtick was like, I'm only interested in love. Yeah. And and early on, it was very clear that it was there was a sexual energy behind that, like with faces and with shadows yeah, specifically. Sure. But yeah. with love streams, I don't know if it's just because of like his reputation at that point or or something else, but like or maybe it's just me projecting, but like, I get this. I get what you're talking about, Kwame, with like the family love of love streams. Mm -hmm. But I also get like this crazy sexual energy off For of sure. them together. And Absolutely. I don't know if that's I mean, like, especially, especially when you come right off the scene where she's like, she said, go like he told her to go find sex. Like, that's what that guy tells her to go do. Yeah, uh, and obviously she goes to like the bar and like meets that guy, and you know at, at the end she says, you know, I'm gonna go spend the night at his house. I'm not gonna go fly. I'm not crazy. I'm not gonna go fly in the rain. Like I'm gonna go stay at his house. And you assume that like they're probably gonna they're probably gonna fuck, but yeah, it's still like that doesn't change. Like there's still like electricity between her and her brother. Yeah, is that yeah. is that kind of your your point? Well, at, I'm or? just I'm just like <clears throat> I just don't. I can't help but think that I'm just projecting it because I know that they were married. Maybe. But I don't know. There's just there's just something interesting about their dynamic beyond what we're given in the story about them being brother and sister of this like yeah. fractured family. I mean, there's there's a lot of scenes to kind of back that up too, especially the scene where um his son comes out and he's like kissing her in the car like that scene yeah. definitely doesn't feel like brothers and sisters especially because he doesn't even come out and say that that's his sister it's almost like he's trying to hide it from people well it's just yeah. the fact that like it's just the fact that like he has cast other actresses he has not been in films before so the nature of the fact that like 
they are yeah. together in real life and people know that and even if they don't we are together and that has to come through and he knows that because he's smart yeah, like for sure them being in it together there is something about there that is that adds like a layer to it that is maybe even so subtextual that like it isn't really a focus but it does kind of imbue the whole thing with this like bizarre <laughs> um yeah uh, yeah which which i think something else that that happens in that same way that it comes through inevitably is that even though at this point Cassavetes has been making critically acclaimed films for over 20 years that's a crazy career he still is poor yeah. like 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 he's still in debt and he's still choosing or or uh, i mean being forced to make a feature film set for the for the most part in his own home yeah pretty bare bones and yeah like very you know what modern day people would call run and gun style filming and he's still doing that and like you have to i i just can't help but think like where is the where is the line in cassavetti's films between by necessity this film looks and moves the way it does because of money and this is my voice and this is how i think a film should be made i think so much of it was his voice especially um there's i mean i guess there's two different close-ups especially because we talked about um kind of like sitting and pointing there are two close-ups that are just seared into my fucking brain um there's the one in opening night where you see jenna Rowland's face like behind the apparition and you mm. it, like you see her eyes like tracing yeah. her that shit that is the most haunting image i think in cinema bar none like that's up there <laughs> with like the the joan of arc one you know the one yeah, yeah. that shit is crazy crazy also, i mean persona once again oh we're talking God, about yeah. all oh we're talking God. about we're talking about all women again just Jesus just so we're clear <laughs> right those three are crazy um, I forgot where I even was. Um, You're talking about the, the images from opening night, or specific images that were seared in your mind. Oh yeah, yeah. Especially talking about like how run and gun they were. I feel like so much of um, probably even talking about like imposing limits on yourself in order to like bring creativity out or whatever. I I feel like so much of it felt labored over. Still, yeah. I don't know. Well, even rewatching opening night that there are a couple of edits in opening night where i was like uh, the <laughs> script was not written like that you guys you guys did that in post but it works really well oh of course i mean because like there's there's certain stuff where either um where you're on set and it's like oh fuck like this like something happened where like that was a great performance and what we should perform for performance, but the lighting is actually that fucked up and we yeah. have to use this other scene, you know, like there, there are some, I'm sure there's some stuff where it's like, Oh, where the audience actually loved that more. And the director's like, I mean, we had a way better thing that like we couldn't even show you guys. Like, I'm sure there is some stuff like that, but I don't know. Well, but that's the thing that makes his work. I think just like it, it is so of, his experience and therefore of his time like mm -hmm. it, it sure sure the reason that they feel so raw and almost documentarian is because of things like that right that like yeah they're not like meticulously polished and sheened for like a consumption they are almost these things that are like shouts from the darkness that are like i this is all i could do but here it is you know yeah while at the same time being these like very very um like complex um uh but also like emotional like they're they're almost like unintellectual like they're so um emotional they're such emotional films and i don't think that like you can make something like that unless you are just so good at what you're doing you know like oh, yeah. it, it almost feels like more refined by time yeah like there, there are things that we're talking about now in some way because like we you know we love the craft of cinema but it's like they don't feel like 
they don't feel like objects to analyze in any way almost they just feel like so emotional and maybe yeah, once again that's why feel... love streams is so complicated for me because it does feel like there is something there to to observe in an in an unemotional way at the same time whereas like the other two opening night and woman feel so just like you're being led down this like path of like raw pure like carnal emotion truly yeah and they love feel streams anti feels like, intellectual almost like yeah 100 percent. do not, Don't do think, not about think about this yeah 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 oh. and that's the power of a very very free um actor. gifted actor at the center of a very um just like robust and um i mean like let's just say it it's like they fuck do you know what i mean like they they have yeah. this just such like effortless like sexy and cool and um unencumbered energy to all of them that like you don't even have the time to be like they, they feel like they would be popular movies now do you know what i mean like they yeah. feel like they would be movies that like would catch on and people would go see in the way that they did with like everything everywhere do you know what i mean that, that she's just like movies that are so like people are going in droves to see them because they hear about how emotional they are you know and yeah. then they happen to stumble into something that is also so like um singular and good uh, i mean there's very few people that are making um yeah especially yeah, like you said singular yeah there's very few people that are making um movies that really even touch the topics that he wants to talk about now um yeah. especially looking at a movie like woman under the influence like i could not imagine a film like that being made no oh no dude there's i like... mean sure sure because the content but like especially putting um a female at the head and um not putting her in a position um like like that one like that like what what jenna was able to do with that character like that one was truly crafted for her to to just go to go to work on like I, I don't even know if a director trusts an actor like that to this point like maybe that's, 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 that's heavy that's heavy work i i think Not if there i think if there is a example of a person who is a direct descendant of the type of actor that Jenna Rollins is, it is Nicole Kidman, who is maybe not necessarily the most like a person that you go to for like, um, uh, like you would I, in some way, like you would never want to see Jenna Rollins in like a period drama, right? Like you wouldn't want to see some, you wouldn't want to see her in like something that's like, um, polished and, uh quote unquote actor refined like refined yeah like prestige right like it's not kate blanchett for example do you know what i mean mm, yeah. but like you want to see somebody who will just like absolutely lose um their sense of self on in front of a camera yeah so i mean how much how much of jenna's performances do you think were i don't i don't know how to phrase it um Like, how much of it do you think was acting, and how much of it felt um, like truly? I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not an actor, so like, I don't know how to even phrase it properly. I mean, um, I think opening night is her most like. Uh, what do you think you could see the performance more in that one? Like, no, you no. See... I, I mean, I mean, yes and no because you're dealing with the concept of acting in that movie. Yeah, there's a duality but... in Opening Night that I think lets her shine even more. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, Woman yeah. Under the Influence is really just kind it's of like so dropped in, like it's yeah, disgusting. <laughs> well, it's like Woman Under the Influence is like you're watching somebody who is yeah, yeah, experiencing something emotional, but she also is like crazy like she like she is mentally ill so it's like you're watching somebody do something that like is a feat of like um skill at the same time to like depict a, a, a quite literally a biological thing that like you are not experiencing right but yeah. like opening night it's this woman who is like from the moment that the movie starts cast into this like i mean literally existential crisis meanwhile everybody around her is like 
totally chill and it's like yeah like everybody's just like i mean we're just we're working and like they, that's something that they <laughs> mentioned there it's like you're not you're not a woman you're a uh fuck fuck what and so it's wa- it's watching this yeah. person like contend with like she knows what it feels to feel peaceful and fine and normal and yet every frame after that girl dies you're watching her move further and further away from that because she knows what she's done yeah there's a there's a shot in opening night that i've never forgotten ever since the first time i watched it and it's the first scene where you see her in her hotel room and she walks in the front door and Cassavetes has gone up with her and he's and she's trying to convince him to to have a drink with her with her yeah, stay with her yeah. so like reeling and they chose like a super wide lens for her shot of entering the hotel room and that hotel room just looks so utterly massive yeah and yeah. empty and she just crosses from the front door to the bar mm-hmm. to get j and b whiskey which like should be an honorary character credited in all <laughs> <Catholic> <laughs> and the floor and the room just looks so huge and because of the distortion of the wide lens gina gets so small so quickly in the frame that while she's crossing the room that it's it's like this again it's like cassavetes does not care about aesthetics he probably just did that for coverage i don't think so but like because like, here's the thing it's the, in sharp contrast metaphor- yeah i I don't know i i want to think that he did it on purpose but just like records show that he didn't care about the camera at all Mm. so i want to think like the dp was like okay you want a shot of her entering the room like i'm gonna zoom all the way out we're gonna get it and we're gonna move on well maybe that's just his instincts as a as a director and or maybe that's maybe that is just like him directing the actor and to like do what they feel and the well, cinematographer the perfect, and the editor because it's maybe the moments a perfect example that. of how like the object exists outside of the director at the same time right like it's like whether he what whatever reason he did it for if he had no reason like it is evocative you know what i mean like oh, it, it's definitely, oh yeah it, if oh, it was yeah. out of necessity or a total like lack of care and for time or if it was like a meticulous choice it's like it he's gone and yet here we are like thinking about this image. Mm. I mean, especially given the fact that, I mean, Jenna is a gorgeous woman and she's presented as you, you, sp- you say like objectify or uh, evocative. She's framed as an object in this movie. And the fact that she becomes tiny in that frame, almost like a toy, especially in sharp contrast to the moments right before that, where her celebrity and her size has forced her into these, incredibly claustrophobic frames wherein there's no headroom you are stuck in this wave of people that in reality is probably only like 20 people as they're coming out of the uh the back door to the theater everything is super duper tight super duper tight and then yeah. like you said like it just explodes like you're able to see like the lines just go into like make a horizon in her yeah. in her hotel room and then she becomes tiny and tiny and tiny. And then right after that, you hear the moment um, where she says, you're not an actor, you're, you're, uh, or you're not a woman, you're an actor, you're like, you're, you're an object, right? And then it's after that moment, sure, the moment where she di- uh, where that girl dies, like this, this ghost is following her, but that almost feels like an excuse for her to, uh, to kind of like hide away, right? Because really she's, really it's, it's the relationship between her and uh, Cassavetti's character, right? The, the person that she's trying to, She's trying to have a conversation with who's avoiding her the entire movie. And now, now that she's uh, forced everybody else to become as raw as possible, she's forced him into this impossible situation to sacrifice his career as a struggling actor to, uh, to sort of um, play along, to, 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 to really act, to really become raw and to find, to find hope in the script or whatever uh, she says earlier. Um, and it's at that moment where it's like, is this written or is this completely improv? And we say that as the audience member, and once again, due to the framing, we, we're, we're looking like past people's heads into the stage, right? Um, are, we the, are we the audience member in the play? Or are we the audience member as, like, as the film? Because well, we that's know why st- I love that, yeah. that, that scene of that frame of her 
in the scene when she's kind of like going off script and John Cassavetti slaps her uh. and she falls to the ground. And then the frame of like, it, of it on her but like the the audience of the play is like in, the, in background. the background oh, and it's like God. you're you're quite literally it's like she is this it's like you're like like the entirety of the audience of the film and the audience in that room is like orbiting around this woman who is like i mean it just like reduces me to like tears i'm just like it's crazy and then her her um the just like almost like cellular pain that you feel from her is it's yeah. overwhelming and and like but then also at the same time like we were just talking about how like it's almost anti-intellectual but that frame is so rich with like metaphor and and yeah. you know i first heard about this movie from john because he was talking about how there's like this He's like, there's this Cassavetes movie called Opening Night with um, Jenna Rollins, and it's about these people who are doing a play, and like a lot of the film is like just like the camera, like watching these people do a play, mm -hmm. and that to me is like this like incredibly like ahead of its time kind of like, I mean it's meta, but like beyond that, it's just like, um, it, it's like everything that everybody was freaking out about the rehearsal like last year is like what that is, you know what I mean? Yeah, and watching these people and at some point like yeah you're in the audience sometimes but at some points you're quite literally like on stage with them and you're inside this narrative that's inside this larger narrative and it, it, it evokes so many like questions about like what is acting and what is reality and like what is like how do you fuse those two things or separate them and um and then yeah, and especially yeah. how much of that even matters for the performance you know, yeah. like as an audience member, like how much of that they're bringing to the performance? Sure. But like um, the fact that even with all of the hell that she was going through, like you're saying this existential crisis, like she was like, no, nah, I mean, I like I'm doing what I have to do to, to be in character. So like, let's fucking roll. Like, let's make this shit happen, you know, so that we can give the best performance possible. We can say as much truth as possible. You know, it's um it's a it's 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 haunting it's a, is it's there, a really interesting film. kwame is there a reason why you chose opening night specifically or was it just the an overwhelming it was the first one, feeling it was the first one i watched it was the first one i watched I yeah mean, that was that was that was something um because i looked at um like the criterion uh subreddit on reddit and they were talking about like oh so like this is the order of cassavetti's films you need to watch and i thank god I started with opening night. I don't know what I would have done if I started with love streams. I don't know what I would have done opening night. I mean, I think that it does. It, it puts all of his, uh, his stylistic choices and the way that he approaches the craft so well. I think that he, I think that that was probably, I think that opening night is probably his magnum opus like bar none. I think that movie is fucking mint. Um, Yes, I mean, I'm happy that that was the one that I that I watched first, but I think that one probably just is his best movie. Um, because so many of his sensibilities um, in regards to, um, as we already said before, an unresolved ending, sort of the uh, the rawness of the of the uh, of the action and everything. Um, almost the is this improv? Is this written? Like, uh, almost like. Almost like it's a un unreliable narrator, but you know that the narrator is the director. You know, it feels it feels very heightened um, through that. Have either of you seen his film called Husbands? No, that's no. that's next on my list. Okay, that's right before it, Gloria. It would be. I would even if we don't record it, I would love to hear your thoughts on Husbands because. Like I said at the beginning, so much of Cassavetes is Gina and the sensitivity that he's able to uh, create space for via her performances in his films mm. toward women. And Husbands is specifically about men. It's him and Peter Falk and and Ben Gazzara act like no. <laughs> like on a on a trip 
basically like like they just their husbands who basically just start running rampant together as friends yeah and there is a <laughs> an absolutely horrific scene in that film where they all they the group of dudes ends up with a group of girls and they're and they're young girls and they're they're trying to make their moves in in such a way that both the men and the women know like who gets who tonight to fuck you know like like who's seducing who and it is horrific the way that the characters seduce the women and it makes me think of what you were saying earlier scott about cassavetes as an actor being so masculine but also somehow so against what especially what masculinity was at that time mm. because husbands is almost like cassavetes saying okay i made all of these movies about women and now i'm gonna make a movie about men and it is it's a, it's a fantastic film and it's not fully horrific but the the scene specifically where they're like seducing these younger women is just uh, the modern I mean, world is cringe. A, a movie like, about husbands in the seventies sounds like it would be pretty horrific. It sounds like it sounds yeah, pretty, I mean, pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> but but the thing is like the chemistry that all of those men have together because I mean, yeah, of, right, how often right, they yeah, work together crazy. is stunning. I mean, it's like it makes you want to vomit because of like <laughs> There's no fat at all. Like it's directly to truth. They just yeah. don't fuck around, you know? And they're, it's so good. But I would just love to hear what you guys think about that film because it's, I, I wouldn't put it up there with his best films, but it's not like Gloria where it, it feels like a major departure from his voice as we know it. Mm -hmm. Husbands very much fits in the world of the Cassavetes films that we're talking about when it comes to the vision and the voice of the film, Gloria is like a major outlier in my opinion, mm. but husband I mean, I, is so fascinating because you hear so many stories about Cassavetes and Peter Falk on the set of woman under the influence, like just wanting to rip each other's faces off because <laughs> Peter Falk had ideas about what the character was supposed to do and Cassavetes had other ideas, but Peter is like torn between thinking like, is this actor Cassavetes talking or is this director Cassavetes talking? Like, did John want this role for himself? And like, it's just like so tense yeah, and toxic as fuck. <laughs> and, and Ben Gazzara, like killing of a Chinese bookie is so good. And Ben Gazzara is That's so kind of fucking again. good. And and he to me Ben Gazar is like inevitably masculine because of his voice and because I mean, of the like, way he's able to carry himself. Yeah, his, 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 yeah, his, yeah, his yeah. his physicality and like yeah. his voice, like his thinning hair and like you know he he's just like he's a fucking man, you know, yeah, like yeah. I mean, he, you you wouldn't put like especially because like Peter Falk definitely is like a man. Like, you know, you can, he's got like the hairy chest, especially in, um, well, he's like the scrappy dude, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like, like, like Ben Gazzara has so like fast. a, like, he almost looked like a spy in that movie, right? Yeah. Like it almost felt, yeah. Yeah. It felt like, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Go ahead, though. It's just interesting because Husbands has, Husbands has the sensitivity of a director towards his characters and his actors that you are familiar with in a Cassavetes mm -hmm. movie at this point, but it's directed towards men in a way that he doesn't, he doesn't put the spotlight on in any other time. Maybe besides faces faces is pretty, pretty like gnarly and patriarchal. Yeah, it's pretty direct as far as like objectifying like yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. pretty blunt on that front. But I think he 
I think he was able to really dial that in in husbands because there's because now there's the sensitivity that he has toward his characters in his later films and it comes through in husbands and it's all men and you don't I don't know I I just find I find films that are centered around male non-sexual friendships to be very moving because very especially coming from an American because that it's just not really talked about that much, but it is a very, you know, beautiful, intimate thing. Mm. And, and he does it in a really, really interesting and sometimes disturbing way in husbands. Right. Well, especially it's like, when you, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, it's like it, that to me sounds like, I mean, I, I, once again, I haven't seen husbands, but, it's it just makes me think of like Mikey and Nikki, which is not a Cassavetes film, but like mm. Cassavetes is like in this movie. Is, that, yeah, it, it almost <laughs> feels like a Cassavetes film because it's like about these two dudes and like they are just kind of scoundrels, but like one of them more than the other, and you're kind of watching them like fall apart and um and obviously he's in it, and so it it just feels like part of his kind of a canon and oeuvre in some way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that like that realness of the way that he approaches masculinity, definitely, and especially how they still feel very American as films feel, you know, American because you know they're very New York. Um, it feels like it's very much uh, taken in its setting. Um, but I, it almost feels like a lot of it, yeah, is in response to like, like the John Wayne, John Ford like style American films. Um. Of, of old, especially when you look at uh, sort of the years that he was working in. Because um, that sensitivity, it starts all the way back to Shadows when he was in his early his early years, you know? Like, the way that he approached that story as well. Um, especially in regards to, like, that uh, that the power of the family, too. Which is weird, thinking about um, Shadows being his first movies and then Love Streams coming so late in his, uh, in his career. It adds almost like a like a circular movement to his uh to the way that he worked. Yeah. Um. I mean, speaking of Peter Falk, like it's. I mean, once again, it's like if you put Peter Falk's performance, like if you removed it from Woman Under the Influence, like, and didn't think about Jenna Rollins, it would be such like a great performance, and it is. It's just like also in the shadow of her at the same time, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like he's so great in it, but it also in some way is so one dimensional, you know, like he is there to kind of be the voice of the, or to be the experience of the audience in some way of like, you're crazy. Like, I don't know what to do with you. Do you know what I mean? Like you're embarrassing me. Mm-hmm. You're like embarrassing me in front of our family. You're, and it is just kind of. But also being so insistent on the fact that he needs her and yeah. he needs this this family to be together. It's 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 very torn That's in that the way. Thing, like rewatching it rewatching woman, I was like, why the fuck is he not just like I mean he beats the shit out of her a couple times in the movie, but like why doesn't he just beat the shit out of her and leave? Like, why is he fucking I mean, that's, staying? That's a nuclear it's a family nightmare. He didn't want to talk about like the the rumors of her being in a hospital, like like any sort of um talk about his personal life was is like a knock against his his social currency, especially when they're not bringing in as much money. You know, I mean, they're bringing in some money because he's like the he's like the lead dude there, but you know. I mean, that's why that that scene with, yeah, go ahead. That I mean, that scene like when all his like construction buddies come home and she makes them all spaghetti. It's like that is one of my favorite scenes in that whole movie because it's like you're watching. You're like, please hold it together. Please hold it together. Please don't Mm -hmm. sing opera. Please don't sing opera. Please don't tell one of the men that they're handsome. Please don't. It's like, and you're like, you're him. You're Peter Falk. You're like, you're his perspective. You were like please do not like fall apart but at the same time like it's this very like beautiful depiction of this woman who just like is just also a weirdo and like you don't know what the line is between like her like 
borderline psychosis and also just like her weird personality and you're like such an interesting so thing you brought that you're up in too. love with her you're in love with her you're in love with her and also just like please don't be fucking crazy right now like mm-hmm. you like i feel like peter falk in that scene i'm just like i am so in love with you but also don't be fucking crazy these are my yeah. friends yeah and and then when they all leave and it's just them at the dinner table and she's like telling him like i'll be what you want me to be like it's just heartbreaking to watch to watch her yeah do you think peter falk on set had an idea of what that film was going to be like do you think he was able because I think Cassavetes had a way of bringing out something in actors that is like drop in to the character and think about nothing else and exist while we're rolling. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Peter Falk was because he, you know, he he was a professional actor in the sense that like he worked a lot and he did a lot of work that wasn't as. You know, psychologically interesting or like exploratory as Cassavetti's films. I mean, yeah, he played Columbo. Exactly. For like <laughs> what, 25 what years or about something like that. Amy, Amy loves Columbo, bro. You gotta be careful. No, I mean, I love Columbo. I mean, it's, but, aw- it's awesome. The thing, you know, that I understood, the thing that I understood about the tension between them was exactly that, which was that like, mm-hmm. it wasn't about the character necessarily. It was about the way that Cassavetti's was as a director. It was like, yeah. we're just gonna like keep the camera on and like, here's the house and like, we'll just go wherever. And Peter Falk's like, whoa 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 whoa. where's my mark like what's the coverage like what are we going from like what line and and casper is like no no, no. Just, like do it yeah just do and it. do it do you think, and do it again <laughs> do you think that peter falk during the filming of the scenes had an awareness of the like seismic shift to acting as a craft that gina rollins was expressing oh i think that that's probably the only thing that centered him you oh because I mean, they they have an interview they, they there's uh i think maybe it's on criterion or maybe it was at some point but they do an interview kind of like um i think it was like a decade or so after cassavetes died where mm-hmm. they were talking about that experience and he's just like he was fawning over like that experience with her specifically he was like i fucking hated john you know that <laughs> but you were like he, he he just talks about how much he remembers like just kind of feeling the um, the the size of her, and she's a small woman. Oh, yeah. I mean, she was a small woman, so um, oh, yeah. I think he oh. definitely. I mean, but also like that's such a like you know meta. I mean, that's meta and like a very um, macro conversation because I mean, cinema in America was changing rapidly at that time overall. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, even just like the thought of like acting was like I don't know, but he definitely like. Rem- spoke directly to her like about how he was like you know amazed at her ability yeah. in those scenes almost driven by her too in that yeah. moment yeah because uh woman was 1974 mm-hmm. and streetcar oh shit was 1951 yeah, streetcar yeah. was like hello before yeah. i mean 70s was stacked though 70s, but that's 70s the was, thing is that stacked. like the, the seismic shift that was Brando in Streetcar, the film, because of the only only the film because of the, you know, audience reached versus the play. Like you, you listen to any kind of surface level film history that actually knows what it's talking about. And and Brando in Streetcar was the beginning of modern acting modern film acting as we know it yeah if if, if it was the start then i think the 60s was definitely what helped solidify that and 70s is what put it over the edge but that's the thing is that like isn't all on him but in my opinion gina rowlands in woman was like i think was what marlon brando was going for in the 50s oh for sure he definitely and like couldn't could sprint. and and couldn't get because in the in 1951 when the movie came out so call it 1950 when the when it was filmed 
Like yeah. that was still when Hollywood was a fucking factory, and oh, there yeah. was like I mean the Hayes every wasn't studio like was putting out sixty films a year. You yeah. know, like they were just cranking them out, and yeah, like there's I... a structure and a schedule that that Streetcar was confined to, that Woman Under the Influence probably wasn't, and yeah. It's just sad to me. I mean, 20 years between them, I didn't know that until now, like looking at it. But like Gina Rollins had the freedom that I think Marlon Brando wanted his entire career. Yeah, sure. I, sure. I think I think you're right. And two things. I think like the I made the comparison to like Brando and Gina Rollins earlier. And I and so I appreciate you bringing that up because I think like. I think the reason General Owens is so impactful too is because it's like it is her and that freedom, but it's that freedom combined with the freedom that Cassavetes as a director provides. Like even in Streetcar, like that movie feels like a Hollywood movie of the time. It's just Brando at the center of it feels like he's doing something even in the middle of the machine, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas like General Owens, it feels like you're watching a actor break new ground in a movie that's also breaking new ground. Yeah, it was because all... at the same time, like you know, people talk about Brando and like they should, but it's like, I mean, Betty Davis then did it better in All About Eve. Do you know what I mean? Is it's like, yeah, facts. People talk about him starting it, but it's like people then I th I think personally did it better, far better, and especially especially in the six like sixties was gnarly. Yeah, was some, yeah. Um, but I mean, but I mean, all, none of that would like all of it is. Like, especially when we look at it, I didn't know that shit was from the 1950s either, 1951. That's, that's crazy. That's super early. Yeah, because it's a very modern feeling film, or sure. at the very least, a modern feeling performance from Brando. But even, even, even Vivian Lee in that film, like, it's almost like she was watching what Brando was doing and was like, I can fucking do that. Yeah. And did it. Like, I, I think the more that we move away from the idea that, like, Marlon Brando is the best actor of all time, the more we actually, like, are aware of the fact that, like, it isn't really that he's the best of all time. He just, like, did it first. He just which had the like, fucking balls. And, I mean, yeah, he had a really, really long career, too. There's a lot to look at. <laughs> yeah, and there's something to be said for, like, doing it first and, like, fair. Yeah, but, like, uh, raping a woman in, in last Bro, in like, I was right. waiting till we got to that, but... Right. It's like I, I just, I mean, like I said, it's like I think yeah, Betty Davis yeah. in All About Eve did oh, yeah. did the thing that like Marlon Brando got so much credit for, but like is is even better. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, with a way yeah. better script. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Oh my god. It sounded it sounded so bit crunched on this end too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since we've talked about All About Eve and opening night is now the time to mention the fact that Ivo Van Hova, the renowned avant-garde theater director, has uh, directed stage productions of both of these films. <laughs> wow. It is, it is the time because the only reason why opening night as a film exists is because Cassavetes wanted to make it a play and Jenna right. Round said she could not do that every night. Damn. Which is fucking fair, because who could? Yeah, that's, that was torture. I mean, that's got to be torture for a... Uh... I mean, especially because like she, it felt so much of it felt meta, where she was talking about um, like crafting a character and like what what an actor has to go through in order to uh to bring a mm -hmm. character because like obviously not, especially when like so much of the uh the reality comes from like what you bring to the character um and not like trying not to go, um, method, um like that doesn't mean that like this is still your job like there's still like a like a sense of like hell that comes with that and also like bringing this character to the stage every single night and we get to see so much of that through um not only the rehearsals but when they presented it the first couple times before they actually build up to the like the actual opening night um yeah no, I, I can imagine um the physical and emotional that you kind of have to get into for doing that every single night the thing is do you think that the play was going to be like the actual what, play or what the play the in the film is yeah or do you think it was going to be a play about a play i guess we'll never know unless we find the manuscript but i i hope personally 
I hope that it would have been what the movie is, but it might have been like the play that they're talking about. Because like so much of the movie, like the ending, like the code of that movie is is what makes that movie like really, really fucking shine. Like there's so much of the movie is is meticulous up to that point. But like that's that's why Scorsese's still working on this movie two years after he stopped shooting it. You know, it's because like he knows that the coda needs to be like that's that's the part that really brings the story together. Like the ending of that movie was incredible. I, I hope to God that it was it was based on the movie, not off the play. Oh. Especially because like it mirrored it so well. So maybe, maybe I'd be curious to know what the play looked like if it was based on the play too. That'd be interesting. It's just so tragic to me that he's like gone. You know, yeah. like he would yeah. still, I mean, he would definitely still be alive right now. And he would still if... be making movies just like all of the, uh, the people that are, that would be his age. Even um, I mean, fucking Spielberg. Yeah. Spielberg, uh, Cronenberg, um, Scorsese, Coppola. Coppola, yeah. Polanski, Allen, all of them. Woody Allen retired. Did he? I mean, I thought he had a movie out this year. He just he just wrapped on a movie in Paris last winter, and that's his last one. That's the last one, huh? That's what he's gonna retire about. with his daughter, wife, daughter, wife. Same difference. Wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually there's a Charlie Rose did an interview with um, uh, Peter Bogdanovich and Jenna Rollins and yeah um, yeah I've watched chunks of it. Who else is about that, John? about Cassavetes, right? Yeah, yeah. I think but it's just else? them two, or maybe Ben Gazzara, but I think it's them two. Yeah, I remember being so annoyed because they all the dudes just like kept interrupting Jenna Rollins, and I was like, it's and that also kept, that happened in the it happened in the Peter Falk Jenna Rollins thing too, and she's clearly a very soft spoken person, so like you know that's I'm sure part of her whole life, but it's just like it feels like. Another reason that his movies feel so like um, ethereal is because once again, like he's gone, and they weren't these very big like cultural moments, and so the only people that really have a connection to them are people who are also old and in the film business, and yeah. and there's not really been any kind of like ret like you know kind of cultural retrospective about their creation and there hasn't really been like a documentary about them and and yeah. it just feels almost like did this really happen like how did we get these like so uh these singular and a quintessential american like canon of films from this very very important director and it almost feels like once everybody dies who knew him it's just gonna go away you know what i mean like um and so seeing her in these interviews where she would know more about him than anybody else seems to not be able to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of sad. It's really sad. Cuz especially cuz like she's um being 90, 91, 92. Yeah, years she's old. pretty old too now. Yeah, like that's just a treasure trove of 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 information and knowledge on on so much. Um as as like for the craft of acting, um, talking about him as a director. Yeah. And it's like, you need to get that information out of her before she passes too. And you need to give her her flowers before she can't smell them, which is a well, that's line the thing off that too, is like, album. Yeah. I mean like any actress worth their salt nowadays, like says that woman under the influence is like their favorite performance. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I yeah. think I specifically like went on a hunt and I was just like, okay, let's, let's like research all these people. And it's like Kate mm -hmm. Blanchett, Nicole Kidman, Julianne Moore, like all these people just like talk the about yeah. that performance. You know what I mean? And I think that that just like makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I also read that she still lives in that house from Love Streams. Really? What? Yeah. yeah. Wow. That house, wow. that house feels like a maze too. Like they were able to make that house, especially because that was like the main setting for it. I, you know it stinks of cigarettes. No, oh, without a doubt. Like, <laughs> it just, and, and whiskey spilled everywhere. Yeah, like it, yeah. It reeks, yeah. <sighs> Did we talk about all the movies? I mean, yeah, yeah kind of. 
We'll have to do a Cassavetes part two, I'm sure. The thing is, is that Cassavetes is like perpetually just important to me. Like, I I just go through phases where it's like he's the only movie that I want to watch is Cassavetes. And that happens fairly often. Yeah. The only other people it happens with is like Godard and Wong Kar Wai and like Orson Welles. Like, I mean, they make very human movies. Yeah. yeah but, but Cassavetes, I don't know. It's just like I could, I could do a Cassavetes episode whenever. Like, like I'm happy to have a, a quote unquote official excuse to rewatch Cassavetti's films. Yeah. And I almost wanted to do a film like Faces or Chinese Bookie for this because those are the films that I've seen the least. Like I've I've rewatched Love Streams and Woman and Opening Night, especially so many times. And again, I'm happy to, but I almost was like, I should do I should do faces because Gina Rounds is still in it and it's still really good, but it's like definitely early, super scrappy John Cassavetes vibe. Yeah. And, and, you know, love streams was the second to last movie that he made. It was the last movie he wrote and it's just a different vibe, but I don't know. Cassavetes I mean, is just so, I did like, not know that that was the last the last movie the second last movie that he made and the last one that he wrote yeah yeah that also like i mean that totally recontextualizes that image too of her sitting at the table at the end and then oh, him God, like him off frame him reaching through the oh Jesus my God. Christ. yeah yeah well, it's like it almost haunting. feels like it, yeah it I almost would... feels like this crazy like like cosmic event that he existed and is now gone and like there's no real record of him being here yeah, yeah i would yeah, i would even call fun. love stream his last film because like yeah i don't remember what the name of his film that he made after love streams is but he like he like took over directing like halfway through and it's this like peter falk alan arkin movie about like golfing i think like i think it's another thing like gloria was where he's like i need to make money for my next movie yeah. money yeah like I, i've never even seen i don't even know the name of it i've never seen it but it yeah i mean it was it was i'm pretty sure it was opening night gloria love streams and then this like weird golf movie and then he died Like, where's the documentary about him? I just, like, we have a whole documentary about Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, but we don't have a documentary <laughs> about the life of the, like, one of the most influential American directors of all time. Uh -huh. There were, like, there were, like six Beatle documentaries last year. It was right. crazy. Right. <laughs> It'll happen. Yeah, and I mean, one of them was... Gonna happen. Wasn't, <sighs> wasn't Peter Jackson's yeah. thing last year? Bro, yeah, he had a he had two documentaries out. He had a was, World War II documentary and he had a Beatles documentary. But like, wasn't the had, Beatles doc like great. nine hours long? I wouldn't be surprised. Like on some Ken Burns shit. Yeah, because it's like all of the unused footage from them recording that it, last record or whatever. It's all used. We've seen it all. I don't need to see any more Beatles shit. <laughs> Why not, Kwame? You don't like the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> shit. Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Wait, can we not use this now? <laughs> we just bleep it all out. Let it be. We can't pay for it anyway. Just let it be. Yeah, Paul, it's really good to hear you singing, Paul. Have you guys heard Kwame? Have you heard? Wait, have you heard Connor's joke about Ringo Starr? What that he's a joke? No, okay. is it was is the oh yeah, go ahead. I think you I think me saying that, I think Kwame, you probably know what it is. He he yeah. said it one time when we were playing strikers, but he was like, um, have you guys heard uh he the joke is set up like this. He's like, 
Um, did you guys hear about how um, Paul McCartney was trying to get um, George and Ringo to go um, see a movie? And we were like, what? And he was like, uh, yeah, it's like this Johnny Depp movie. And they were like, oh, what's it called? And he was like, Ringo. <laughs> hey, Ringo. And it was like a who's on first Ringo Rango joke. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Actually, I don't even actually know if that's what it was, but I just remember him saying <laughs> Rango. the word Rango, Rango the in like the craziest like fucking accent and um oh, god, it is incredible. Rango. <laughs> oh. I miss Connor, man. I haven't talked to him in a while. Connor, if you're out there, let us know your favorite cast of Eddie's film. Or just leave me a voicemail of you saying Rango. I'd appreciate that, too. So, Scott, do you think that you could put into, like, a uh, cohesive statement why you felt like choosing Woman Under the Influence as your film? Yeah. I I think it just um is the coalescing of a a director and the way that he makes movies meeting with a performer who needed that way to to be her best and if cinema is about a a director using a performance to get a at both times like emotional but also visually um metaphoric and beautiful object i just think that that film in in the canon is the best example of him and her together um i i think that her performance in that is obviously so influential as i've mentioned and um and every time i i start it i'm filled with dread and love and um like an overwhelming sense of emotion that i know i'm not going to be able to hold back and i think that that is to me like the the a thing that i chase and try to find in other films because of that film and I'm just always let down. Um, so, yeah. yeah, there's very few films that that make you feel the way that film does. Um, and I think you're right; it is a culmination of a lot of different things. Do you think that? Do you think that was this? So this one wasn't your first Cassavetti's film that you had watched. So like, no that that one was the first one that I'd ever seen. Oh, that was the first one. Interesting. Yeah. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think that it? Did it still hit the first time you watched it? Or do you think that it um Oh, it felt like it it really felt like one of those moments that like that if ever I do anything in my career in 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 the rest of my life, I will look back and be like this was the thing that in, like influenced and inspired me. Like it it made me be like this is what's possible now. Yeah. Like it and moved the needle forward. You know, and that's not even just like as an actor. That's like as a as a writer, as an actor, as a director. Like as a yeah, as it's a everything. Person, performer. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like it it introduced me to yet another person that I can look to to be like, oh, this guy acted and also wrote and also directed, mm -hmm. and and in some way created a new position, which is just kind of like a facilitator of other of like a of a perform a per performer. Um. Yeah, being at their best, you know, like that's a very interesting way to point that to facilitator. Yeah, yeah. So it it it. I just vividly remember like watching it and being like, "Holy shit, this is like what is actually possible." Um, and it's it's like the the gap between that and the the thing before that is so wide now that I'm like, and now it's hopeless because what else is out there? I mean, there's nothing else to make me feel that way, but. But I always have that. And then, I mean, yeah, it's like opening night, love streams, faces. Like, these are all other things that, like, um, 
and it's like they all hit do you know what i mean it's a crazy like that they are all so different but like you can feel him in it and especially when it's working with jenna it's like they, there's just this like material to them that is so you almost feel like you shouldn't be watching it you know yeah. like he it really reminds me of like when you're like un... yeah it's like it reminds me of like when you're like hiding under a bed and you're like um like as a joke or something but then you like accidentally overhear something that you're like that has like rocked your world or like you've seen something you know what i mean yeah like you're paying for the consequences of yeah that's that what yeah. that's what his movies feel like to me it's like you're like a kid and you're watching the adults like ruin their lives kind of you know yeah um so it's like at some points like so playful and gracious and um awe-inspiring and also like totally heartbreaking and um yeah i really can't get past the fact that like every time that we describe his movies they don't feel like american in the way that we describe them like when we talk about um like even the way that you described it like i i would describe so much of um so much of vortex that way or uh or like you guys brought up godard earlier like so mm. much of it feels um it feels out of place well but i i don't think that we can like not acknowledge the fact that that has to be in some way connected to the fact that like they were a um uh, they were i don't i'm trying to use buzzwords that are annoying but like <laughs> like american cinema is capitalist like it's about money yeah. is the studio system it is like here's your money but here's what you can do and he was yeah. like i'm gonna act in your movie and take your money and make my movie the way that i want to make it yeah that's, that's how all of the like european people that we're talking about that's what they like you know it's like you see a european movie nowadays it's like the amount of people putting money into it it's a lot of yeah. people because it's not a lot of money but yeah, it gives yeah. the person freedom to make the movie they want to make rather like than art fun the school this yeah, yeah yeah rather than paramount you know what exactly. i mean like rather than 20th century fox or whatever the fuck it's called now um That's like i don't think that we can remove the fact that like one of the reasons his movies feel the way that they do is because they are totally free from like stricture in a way yeah like he made the movie he wanted to make and you can feel that True. well just like i said earlier that one of cassavetes sticks was that he's only interested in love mm. another one of his sticks i think it's actually in that interview that you've been referencing about love streams Kwame. i can't remember mm. but he's like giving this french or european uh television person a tour of his like home and and studio like like where he works where he's editing and he has the guy next to him and he's like you don't understand this because you're european but the thing about america is that the more in debt that you are the more money they will give you and I just keep making my monies. I keep making my movies on money that I don't have. And he's like explaining basically the American credit system <laughs> to this to this European dude. And and the European guy's like, oh yeah, like he doesn't really get it. But Cassavetes is giving this like profound observation on what it is to make an independent movie in america while considering like the american banking system yeah and as that, like a that potential that funder a, like, like the like the literal sacrifice that you're making to yourself yeah to like you're these you're films. taking on debt against your name against yourself but, yeah <laughs> yeah but the more debt that you have the more i can make another movie credit <laughs> lines they'll give you yep and, Yo, and that, it's, it's so awesome to watch Cassavetes, which you know he's like you know he's like four or five films deep, so he like he knows what he's talking about, and he's telling this European dude like, you don't get it like in America, like I don't need a studio, 
because I can just keep taking loans out. I have JP Morgan Chase. <laughs> exactly. Like I can just I'm in so wallet? in debt. I'm so in debt that they'll just keep giving me money because they know I'm fucked, you know? Yeah. Like it, it's awesome. It's it's like it's I think about that all it's real the grimy. fucking time. <laughs> Dude, he fucks so hard. Oh my I mean, god! I mean, like it's it's like the most legendary, and he's so nonchalant about it. You know, he's yeah. like smoking a cigarette, and he's like, "You don't get it. Like, the more money I owe America, the more money they give me." <laughs> like, and then that's it, you know. And you're just like, you. "What? Holy shit! Oh my <laughs> god!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's I. But you can see that, for example, in love streams, because like, why the fuck are you in your 25th or whatever year of being a director and you're, you're shooting still your house. shooting in your own house? <laughs> yeah, it's oh, my fucking God. Yeah, because you know, crazy. like, like that's that's like <laughs> our mentality, you know, like we don't have any producers attached yes. to us. Yes, we're still trying to make movies and we write scripts and, you know, it's just like, fuck it, we'll shoot it in our apartment. Fuck yep. it, like whatever, and like uh, you know, that's like that mentality. But like twenty five years into, and and you know, his films were premiering yeah. at Cannes. Like he wasn't yeah. like a nobody. Yeah, like imagine Fableman's being shot at like Spielberg's house. Spielberg's home. It would never happen. Yeah, no shot. Yeah, that's freaky. I'm Especially looking at like photos of John Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins now. <laughs> my parents, my mother and father, they raised me. Oh. oh my god, the photo of him holding her when she's wearing that pink shirt in Love Streams. When she's like drunk and it's like super late at night. Oh, where um she goes in there and he puts on the record? Yes. Yeah. And now we just have like God, what muck we live with now. We live with now. We live with now. 